afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Bauhaus and Beyond, a live talk with G. Martin Moeller, Jr., brought to you by Architectural Adventures. Thank you for taking the time to join us today and learn a little bit about the Bauhaus and the Architectural Adventures itineraries that will be occurring September 21st through the 30th, 2018. I'd like to introduce our presenter for today's live talk, Martin Moeller is an architectural curator, writer, and editor who works both independently and on a part-time basis as senior curator at the National Building Museum. Martin is also the subject matter expert who will be leading this architectural, uh, architectural adventures tour in September. Martin, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're very happy and excited to hear from you today and learn a little bit about this trip. Thank you, Hasti. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we can go ahead and go to the first slide, please. Uh, as many of you probably know, the Bauhaus will actually be celebrating its centennial next year. It was founded in 1919, uh, which is a little hard to imagine because when you look at so much of the work that was done then, a lot of it feels so fresh, so current. Uh, many of its ideas are, are uh, absolutely uh, still at the forefront of our thinking and architectural practice and uh, education today, uh, it's, it's sometimes a little tough to remember that this is a century-old institution. Uh, I've always found it fascinating that the history of the Bauhaus, which existed from 1919 to 1933, almost exactly coincides with the era of the Weimar Republic. Uh, and if you don't know your German political history, which uh, is understandable, uh, that was the time between World War I and uh, the rise of the Nazis that was uh, initially an incredibly um, frantic time with uh, all, all sorts of, of socio social and economic problems, hyperinflation, etc. Uh, and also, of course, a time of great excitement. Uh, if you think of the era of uh, cabaret, uh, some of the glamour of Berlin uh, during the 1920s when so much was going on culturally, uh, that was that was a, uh, I think broadly true uh, throughout Germany. There was a great deal going on in terms of uh, the arts, the crafts, and certainly architecture. And so um, it's it's not surprising that the Bauhaus would have flourished uh, during that time and unfortunately come to a crashing conclusion with the uh, advent of uh, of the Nazis. Um, it also roughly coincided with prohibition in the United States, which is <laughs> completely unrelated, but it just gives you a sense of that same uh, time frame. Um, the Bauhaus was actually founded in the same city where that the, the constitution of the Weimar Republic uh, was, was drafted, uh, and that being Weimar, and that's why it, it, that, that uh, term is applied uh, to that era. Uh, of course, as many of you I'm sure know, it was founded by uh, Walter Gropius, who was already a prominent young architect, uh, pictured here uh, at an older stage, uh, who uh, had made a name for himself working with uh, his partner Adolf Meyer, uh, particularly for the design of the Fagus factory, which was just one of these great early monuments of modernism uh, that really got people to think about the possibilities of architecture and industrial design uh, in new ways. And I think it's very uh, important to uh, understand what Gropius's motivation for the Bauhaus was. Uh, in the manifesto for the Bauhaus, this was the days; these were the days when you had to have a manifesto if, <laughs> if you were talking about architecture and design. Uh, the first line is, quote, the ultimate aim of all creative activity is the building, exclamation point, end quote. So this was a guy who was uh, was establishing this new school, really, which actually grew out of some existing institutions, uh, with an eye towards uh, making architecture really the master of, of all the arts, once again, um, which is why it's particularly interesting and ironic that the school did not have a department of architecture for its first six years, which is something that uh, many people find surprising. Next slide, please. So, of course, while uh, Gropius was the uh, the founder of the Bauhaus and one of the most famous names, uh, an incredible array of other people came through the Bauhaus as faculty members, so-called masters or teachers. Uh, this is a shot that includes a number of uh, people of, of, of varying degrees of fame. Many people would recognize, recognize the name of uh, Laszlo Mahalinaj. Um, Herbert Bayer is perhaps less well-known, though incredibly talented. You see uh, uh, Gropius there at the center, and to his left, our right on the screen, a uh, very uh, young-looking Marcel Breuer. 
Uh, and I would also note off to the right, you'll notice a woman, uh, Gunther Stolzel, who was uh, the first uh, female uh, master, uh, the first female instructor there in uh, the uh, textile department. Um, and while I, I don't want to overplay it, this, this was a very different time, and certainly uh, w women and, and other people who would traditionally have been excluded from, uh, from these kinds of roles, uh, they were not completely uh, welcomed uh, with open arms, as one might have hoped. Uh, but I would say that the Bauhaus was ahead of the game in that regard, uh, in terms of incorporating people of different backgrounds, incorporating women uh, as students and, and teachers. They, that was not without struggles, believe me. Gunther Strotzel had to work uh, to get to the point uh, that, that she ultimately achieved. But uh, there were some openings there that I think uh, were important in the history of, of uh, beginning to make architecture a somewhat more inclusive profession, obviously something with which we're still struggling today. Next, please. Uh, as I mentioned, Bauhaus uh, was founded in uh, Weimar. Uh, actually, it grew out of well, grew out a number of things, that, that uh, a number of movements, and uh, some of these are really very surprising. Uh, it, when you read much of the early written material by uh, Gropius and the other uh, uh, key people at the Bauhaus, you find lots of references to uh, William Morris, uh, you know, the arts and crafts movement in England. Uh, when I have talked about the Bauhaus before, given lectures about it, uh, I have a chance to have a larger slideshow and show pictures of some of these uh, antecedents for the Bauhaus, and people are kind of astonished. They, they think, wait, William Morris, the guy with all the fancy wallpaper, the Bauhaus, which was all about white? Uh, but in fact, the the ideas behind the Bauhaus, the connecting of arts and crafts, the elevation of crafts to a level of the fine arts, all of those fundamental ideas do, in fact, come out of some of these earlier movements, uh, including including William Morris and and some of his uh, cohort. Um, other influences included the uh, the Wiener Werkstätte, essentially German for uh, workshops. Another uh, movement that really was trying to elevate uh, craft and uh, handwork, etc., and uh, particularly the the Deutsche Werkbund, uh, which was a group of of architects and designers who uh, were eager to make connections between design and industry. And that's another thing that is often uh, kind of left out of this, although it's quite logical because many people do think of Bauhaus design and they look of thing, they think of things that have a kind of an industrial look, but they don't necessarily consider the, the purposefulness of that, that there was really an idea of bringing design to the masses. Uh, this is now well into the Industrial Revolution, but uh, of course, at, at the beginning of the 20th century, there were new opportunities, new technologies, steamships that were plying the oceans. Uh, we you know, were aircraft by then in rudimentary form. So people were thinking of technology in entirely new ways. And many of the people behind the Bauhaus were eager to exploit those potential connections and use them as ways of elevating design. Uh, what you see here in this slide is the original uh, Bauhaus School of Design in Weimar, uh, which was actually built, um, uh, of course, before that. If you notice the date, uh, it goes back before the Bauhaus. It was actually a building for the uh, Academy of Fine Arts uh, in Weimar, and it was designed by uh, Henri van de Velde, a Bel Belgian artist and painter who had been a member of the uh, uh, the, the uh, Deutsche Werkbund. Um, it's a beautiful building, still standing, uh, and it, it reminds us that the Bauhaus actually didn't come out of nothing. It, it was uh, founded essentially through a merger of two existing institutions, this Academy of Fine Art and a former School of Arts and Crafts. So uh, already that was, was um, it, its very genesis was, I think, appropriate to, to uh, help us understand that uh, that juncture that they were trying to achieve between these these various artistic and craft uh, disciplines. Next, please. I love showing this picture. Again, I've mentioned the the origins of the Bauhaus in the uh, the arts and crafts movement and other movements, uh, the, uh, the Vienna Succession, uh, Secession, excuse me, and a lot of these uh, other movements that many people have heard of. Uh, I, I, I always think it's interesting to um, to prevent, present images and information that kind of shake up people's understanding of movements that they think they understand very well. Uh, what you're seeing here is the Zomerfeld House, actually a villa in Berlin. This was the first built work of a group of Bauhaus faculty. 
And when you look at that, this and you think of what we associate with Bauhaus now, you see none of that. You don't see white, plain walls. You don't see uh, abstract forms. You, you, you see something that looks kind of in, in ways like a log cabin. Uh, and in fact, it is made of heavy timber. Uh, Mr. Sommerfeld, Adolf Sommerfeld, was a timber merchant. Uh, he uh, actually uh, had uh, salvaged a great deal of timber, timber from a shipwreck, which he instructed the architects to use. Uh, good, good, nice bit of uh, recycling, sustainable design to reuse these uh, this reclaimed wood uh, in this this house. But it it certainly has. A, I think a great elegance to it. It has a, a there's a real sense of, of careful design, particularly when you get in the interiors where you see wonderful details, carvings, etc. But it completely defies the expectation of people who think of Bauhaus in a in a very one-dimensional way as a bunch of plain white boxes. So it's an important reminder of those more complicated origins of the Bauhaus uh, than some people uh, are, are often aware of. Next, please. Uh, one of the stories of the Bauhaus that runs throughout is uh, political, and it's very interesting because uh, Gropius was very clear from the beginning that he was not particularly interested in politics, and he actually on a number of occasions uh, issued statements, written statements, uh, spoken statements saying that uh, while well, well, students could get involved in what they wanted to and faculty could, he, he didn't see this as a political institution. Uh, but in the context of, of what was going on in Germany, as we all now know, with the rise of, of nationalism and um, uh, a, a great paranoia about uh, a variety of, of uh, other people, uh, ethnic groups, whether whether Jews or, or uh, people from certain countries, um, and also just direct political phobias uh, in, in an era in which words like socialism and communism and Marxism, and then as now, I guess, are tossed around rather casually. Um, it was very easy to label this very progressive school as a, as a hotbed of, uh, of potential political, uh, uh, political disarray. And uh, in fact, there were many people who identified as socialists at the Bauhaus. There were many Jewish students and faculty members at the Bauhaus. And so uh, in that context, uh, it's uh, sadly all too easy to understand uh, why uh, it, it soon was in the, the crosshairs of the Nazis. What many people aren't aware of is that uh, the Nazi party uh, and, and that whole ideology really emerged rather gradually. Uh, it wasn't a single moment when Hitler took power and all of a sudden things were, were different. Uh, and it tended to happen on a regional basis. And one of the places where uh, some of those forces came into power early on was Weimar. And as a direct result of that, the original school in Weimar was closed down. And it was then that the, the school reopened, the Bauhaus reopened in the relatively nearby town of Dessau. Uh, and you see here the image of what is the quintessential Bauhaus building, the Bauhaus itself. This is what we think of, I think, when we, uh, when we hear the word Bauhaus. Uh, this is the uh, spectacularly uh, sleek, industrial, modern uh, building that uh, became associated with the movement. Uh, so it's somewhat ironic that the move to Dessau gave them, uh, well, seemingly problematic, gave them the opportunity then to uh, to build this new facility that uh, really helped to exemplify uh, their, uh, their ideas. Uh, it is a fascinating building, beautifully restored, uh, lots of great details in terms of lighting and interiors and so on. And uh, while certainly you're, you see elements of the, the that plain industrial aesthetic, the, the relatively unadorned expanses of wall there, you also get a sense of the, the geometrical um, complexity of it. Uh, this is not always just about the simplest and the purest thing, but is often about um, uh, very complex ideas that are rendered in ways that seem uh, really so simple and straightforward. Next, please. Uh, well, unfortunately, things uh, continued to decline, decline, deteriorate throughout the country politically, and uh, eventually the, the uh, Bauhaus was forced from Dessau as well, uh, ending up uh, in Berlin. Uh, in an existing factory building that uh, obviously was uh, uh, just a, a, an existing space that they were able to occupy on a, on a very pragmatic basis. Um, at this point, uh, Gropius had long stepped down as uh, director. He had been replaced for a while by 
uh, uh, his his follower in that role, Hannes Meyer, an avid and very vocal Marxist, uh, which didn't help things uh, very much. He took over in 1928. Uh, but lasted only a couple of years before uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe took over as director of the school in 1930, while it was still in Dessau. And it was under Mies that the school made its last move uh, to 1932. And if you remember my uh, early statement about the time frame of the school's history, uh, you'll see that the Berlin period was very short. It was only a, about a year later that uh, uh, the Nazis, as they were coming to nationwide power, uh, finally uh, closed down the Bauhaus. Um, one of the ironies of this uh, is that the great attention that uh, that the Nazis paid to the Bauhaus in all of its incarnations uh, probably directly led to the fame and influence of, of that institution throughout the world. There were other schools around Germany that were doing frankly, equally innovative things, uh, and in, in some cases, arguably even more innovative in the arts. Uh, Stuttgart had a great art school that was, was uh, uh, a real hotbed of, of, of uh, innovation. Um, but it was the, the persecution, perhaps, of the Bauhaus, uh, not, not unprecedented. There were certainly other schools that faced similar problems, but uh, ironically, it was uh, by virtue of the Nazis' attention on the Bauhaus that uh, it, uh, it, it became so influential. And partially, that's for a very simple, straightforward, practical reason, which was that uh, many of the people who had been involved with the Bauhaus uh, fled for obvious reasons because they were uh, in danger uh, coming to the United States uh, or other countries, um, what was then British Mandate Palestine, and carrying those ideas uh, with them. So that became a very uh, powerful lesson, I think, uh, for uh, for other uh, schools and other movements uh, as, as they were taking place around the world. Next, please. Uh, so the, the Bauhaus did have uh, its three main sites. Dessau is still uh, the middle site, I think, is still the one that is, is most closely associated with the school because of the uh, existing building. Uh, and there are other buildings in Dessau that are equally significant. Uh, the Meisterhäuser, the master's houses, where some of the uh, faculty members at the, uh, at the school lived, uh, are great cases in point. And, one of the reasons I love this picture is here you see some of the kind of stereotypical Bauhaus forms, very simple, straightforward geometrical forms, uh, the simple pipe railings. But again, take a note at some of those vibrant colors, the little hint of red in the door frame to the right, the beautiful uh, blue to the left, and the uh, kind of a, um, in this shot looks like a bit of a, a pinkish lavender in the, the downspout there. Um, Another of those ideas that, that I often find people uh, uh, mention to me when they're talking about the Bauhaus is, oh, it's all white, 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 white. And as you see, when you go through the master's houses and some of the other uh, Bauhaus projects, that was not the case. I mean, this was, after all, a school where there was a foundation course uh, that uh, prepared students for all disciplines uh, in a variety of different visual media. And there were, there were great courses in color theory. Um, and form making and so on. And, and that's one of the distinguishing features of the Bauhaus as an academic institution and something that has uh, continued to influence architectural education today. Anyone who's been to architecture school or art school and had one of those foundation courses, uh, to some extent, uh, they can, can thank the Bauhaus for that idea. Uh, I might mention uh, one of the people not uh, pictured in that uh, photo earlier of the various faculty members was uh, a guy named Johannes Eaton, uh, who was a fascinating character and emblematic of some of the other uh, very intriguing aspects of the Bauhaus. Uh, it did have its kind of cultish uh, aspects. Uh, Eaton uh, designed his own clothing. Uh, it tended to look rather uh, monk-like. Uh, he sort of looked himself like a shaved-headed version of Rasputin. Um, he was the person responsible for the preliminary course, so, uh, uh, clearly a genius, but also a a, a bizarre figure. He um, actually encouraged the uh, food service at the Bauhaus to serve a, a sort of garlic-based mashed gruel of some sort that uh, uh, led many people to joke that you could always tell a Bauhaus student because their breath smelled of garlic. Next, please. Uh, so in the tour, we will be covering not only the Bauhaus sites directly, the schools, the, the, the locations of the school. As I mentioned, the one in Berlin is uh, no longer standing. Uh, but other projects that uh, either were 
were the direct work of Bauhaus faculty or students, uh, or in some cases were uh, were inspired uh, by the ideas of the Bauhaus or otherwise connected to uh, the Bauhaus uh, development in some way. One example of that in Berlin is the uh, Siemensstadt uh, Ringsiedlung. Siemensstadt, if that looks familiar, that's basically Siemens City. Uh, as in the Siemens factory, uh, a company that still exists. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. And there were, I believe, tens of thousands of workers in that factory. And it was, um, as this was being built in the uh, uh, late 1920s, early 30s, there was a real demand for housing. And uh, this was an opportunity to put some of the Bauhaus ideas uh, to work at, at the scale of an entire neighborhood. Next, please. And again, the the details, though, of this, you know, actually getting up there close and personal to the project uh, are often surprising for people who think they know the Bauhaus. Uh, this is an example of a set of road buildings by Hugo Herring, uh, who uh, was actually uh, you know, directly connected to various people involved with the Bauhaus in a variety of ways. Uh, so it, it's a bit peripheral, but certainly uh, a, a direct connection. And um, you see here these wonderful curving balconies, which are really beautiful with the, the, the plants that are there, uh, the interesting character of the masonry. Uh, this has some color and texture to it, and yet it is a quintessentially modern project. This is very much uh, it, it, exemplifying the ideals of the Bauhaus in a variety of ways, uh, one of which is the, the sort of social component of this. Uh, Hannes Meyer, whom I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the second director of the Bauhaus, was very concerned about uh, housing and uh, particularly finding ways to make sure that the, the typical worker at any level had decent housing available to him or her and, and uh, their families. And this is uh, a, a case in point of this where uh, it's, I think, a really very humane uh, complex, even though if you remember that earlier image, you, you looking at that model from above, it looked like you know, potentially some of the uh, less savory urban renewal projects that we came to associate with uh, the negative aspects of modernism later on. Um, when you get up close and personal to these, you often find some really thoughtful details and wonderful, um, wonderful architectural imagery. Next, please. Another example of that is the Waldsiedlung Zellendorf. Uh, Wald is the German word for forest. So again, giving you a hint of, of the idea, some of the ideas behind this of trying to create uh, green space. You know, putting buildings in green space. So you see trees off in the in the uh, background of of the row houses there to the left. Um, and trying to create some of these uh, more, if not outright pastoral, at least more open and uh, healthier environments they envisioned uh, for uh, for workers typically. Um, you're seeing here some projects that were done by uh, Bruno Taut and others. Uh, Taut uh, was famous as a member of the uh, glass chain. He did the uh, spectacular crystalline pavilion at one of the Werkbund exhibitions. Uh, and so even though he was not directly affiliated with the Bauhaus, uh, he was affiliated with a number of people who were affiliated with the Bauhaus. And there were many connections back and forth. And it's easy to see some of those uh, ideas flowing in both directions. Again, here, if you just looked at the, the buildings to the left and saw those white expanses with simple punched windows, you could easily think of that as a more stereotypical Bauhaus building. Uh, it's given some life by the uh, the course of brick at the bottom and then kind of framing the uh, the entryway and the uh, the stair tower there. Uh, but again, look at the colors. Uh, much like the master's houses uh, in uh, Dessau, uh, you see some really bright colors there that uh, enliven the architecture in a way that is sometimes unexpected. Next, please. So the, the tour does uh, end up in Berlin. That's the grand finale. And since unfortunately the uh, Bauhaus um, site there did not survive, um, that there are, uh, and we will be seeing some of the uh, housing estates, as I mentioned, that have a direct connection to Bauhaus. But frankly, <laughs> you can't go to Berlin without uh, taking some time to look at some of the other fascinating stuff that has been going on there, particularly since uh, German reunification. Uh, it's been a real hotbed of uh, cutting edge design um, in a variety of scales. Uh, and some of the most ambitious projects occurred early after the reunification. And many of you may have heard of uh, Potsdamer Platz. Uh, this was uh, a, a ruin during the, the Cold War. It had been right at the juncture between East and West Berlin uh, and with the, the wall literally going uh, right beside it. Um, 
this is uh, uh, an, inc an incredible transformation. Uh, what happened there, I, it was very purposeful. The German authorities were absolutely interested in making sure that uh, there was a sense, a visual architectural sense of that reunification. And so the redevelopment of Potsdamer Platz and the area around it, you see here uh, the nearby Sony Center, uh, which was done by Helmut Jahn and completed in 2000. Um, this this was meant to be to re restore what had been once one of the centers of Berlin and make it that once again. There was no shying away from that that critical fault line uh, between East and, and West Berlin. This was this was going to be the the very symbol of that reconnection. And so we'll be touring places like this and looking at some of the fascinating uh, contemporary architecture that has been going on in in Berlin uh, since the unification. Uh, well, and even before, but uh, particularly since uh, the last uh, 20 years or so. Next, please. And another perfect example of that, uh, widely published, uh, the interior of the DZ Bank lobby, uh, not far from the Brandenburger Tor, the Brandenburg Gate, the, one of the famous symbols of Berlin, which used to be right at the juncture of the wall. Um, at, at risk of revealing my, or hinting at my age, uh, I do remember visiting Berlin before the wall came down, and it was a haunting experience to stand atop the platform that was constructed on the West Berlin side so that you could climb up to the top of the steps and peer over into East Berlin, uh, not far from the point of this building that you see here and contemplate the incredible disjuncture between the, these two societies uh, that had so much in common. And um, I was actually there in 1989, uh, about six weeks before the wall came down, and I thought it was never going to happen in my lifetime. And then it did. And now we have seen incredible activity, cultural activity, uh, in design, uh, in this, this Frank Gehry project for the interior of this bank lobby with this uh, phenomenal uh, uh, conference room uh, that you see uh, there off to the left. Uh, again, another one of the sites that's just emblematic of how far uh, Germany and Berlin in particular have come uh, over the last few years. Uh, so with that, that gives you a hint of some of what you'll be seeing, some of what we'll be talking about. Um, it's a really rich story, and the thing that's exciting to me is the opportunity to help people uh, come to appreciate the uh, the Bauhaus history and all of its complexity. It's not all about the white box, and uh, it's really great to have a chance to see some of this up close and understand why uh, the Bauhaus influenced many more things even than we sometimes give it credit for. And with that, I will turn it back to Hasti, who has a few things to discuss in terms of the logistics of the tour. Martin, thank you so much for taking the time and effort to present today. Um, we really appreciate uh, you lending your expertise to provide us and those on the phone with a preview of what they can expect during this architectural adventures trip. Uh, I think it's obvious to say that uh, travelers on this trip are in for a treat with having you be their subject matter expert. I'm just going to finish with a few slides about our tours and then about this tour in particular. As many of you know, Architectural Adventures is the official travel program of the American Institute of Architects. You can see a few uh, shots on the right-hand side of some of our small group tours that have occurred. Our approach to travel is that we provide travelers with an opportunity to receive educational guidance and, and commentary from architectural experts such as Martin, um, while giving our travelers a chance to experience the culture, history, and heritage of the destinations um, that are part of our program. Um, for this trip in particular, again, uh, the Bauhaus uh, itinerary will be leaving from September 21st through the 30th of this year. You see all of the days, I won't go through um, all of them because I will be sending you the catalog as well as the recording from today's session and the PowerPoint. But just a few things about this trip. Um, the cost for the Bauhaus and Beyond itinerary is $5,295 per person based on double occupancy. You have also a $695 single supplement. We do like to offer you a $100 per person discount for the Bauhaus tour for participating in today's webinar. If you're interested in receiving this discount, just mention the webinar when you call Architectural Adventures, um, and I will provide you that information at the end of today's presentation. Also, this trip qualifies for 25 learning units for AIA members. Definitely not a requirement to be a member um, in order to participate on this trip. Um, however, if you do happen to be an AIA member, uh, you can uh, receive 
uh, continuing education credit for attending. Um, the next few slides have screenshots of your accommodations during this uh, trip. You can see the Doreen M. Gote Park uh, in Weimar, as well as where you'll be staying in Dessau. And lastly, uh, your accommodations in Berlin. I have the 2018 trip schedule here for architectural adventures. If you're interested in learning more about the Bauhaus and beyond or any of our other itineraries, you can visit our website at um, architecturaladventures.org or feel free to contact us at 1-800-293-5725. Again, um, for participating in today's webinar, we would like to provide a discount of $100 per person. Just mention um, attending this webinar today uh, when you call Architectural Adventures. With that, again, I'd like to thank Martin for his fascinating talk today and taking the time and effort to be with us. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for participating on the call. Have a wonderful afternoon.